Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. For any common technical issues, please refer to the help widget located at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. Questions will be answered immediately following the presentation. Any resources and links provided from today's presentation can be found in the resource list. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Let's get started. So uh, welcome to the um, day on advanced lectures. I'm Alek Agrawal and together with John, uh, we'll uh, talk to you today about some of the foundations underpinning applications of reinforcement learning to real world problems. Now, you've probably heard about reinforcement learning recently. It's been in the news a fair bit for a variety of reasons. Some of the probably most uh, uh, popular successes have come from various uh, uh, game domains, whether it's in board games like uh, Go, uh, video games like um, Dota, StarCraft, or even multiplayer uh, settings like poker. Uh, there have been other um, uh, cases such as uh, the recent result on uh, solving Rubik's Cube using a, a robotic arm and other manipulation tasks of that flavor. There have also been notable applications in um, real industrial settings uh, where reinforcement learning is now being deployed, uh, such as for making uh, various kinds of personalized recommendations uh, for doing um, for, for controlling autonomous systems, whether it's um, things like uh, sailplanes and drones or um, large-scale cooling systems. However, I have to say that um, industry applications still uh, remain uh, fewer and further in between than we uh, think about sort of applications of machine learning in industry at large, uh, to, the, to the point that actually some, some of uh, our efforts in this area uh, in building out a service which enables easier deployment of reinforcement learning in uh, products was in fact recognized uh, recently by an award by ACM uh, Special Interest Group on Artificial Intelligence uh, because uh, reinforcement learning is not uh, that widely being industrially used yet. So what we'll try to do uh, through, the, through this hour today is talk to you about uh, the opportunities as well as challenges in trying to uh, apply reinforcement learning to real world settings. And uh, I'll use this running example to both illustrate concepts and uh, various um, um, structural, structural assumptions we'll need at different points of time. And this is a pretty simple uh, example. Um, so we all have desk jobs. Um, sometimes maybe it's um, good to take a break, a very short break, and do some physical activity. And there's a variety of apps that you could use that based on some um, uh, long-term health goals that you might set, would try to give you a, a, a good exercise recommendation to you if you are gonna take a short break, like should you uh, do some crunches, Did you, should you do some squats, should you just like do a lap around the office or something, right? So, so, so you have um, any of these uh, possibilities you, you could choose from, so let's think about uh, what the process looks like from the point of view of that app, right? So uh, it probably senses something about the current state of the user. Maybe, you know, how, when did you have your last meal? What time of day it is? Um, what's maybe your, uh, if we are getting any kind of um, monitoring data, what's your current um, heart rate, pulse, etc.? And based on all these, uh, it might suggest some activity that might be beneficial to you and monitor some sort of outcome, such as the number of calories you burned, the number of steps you walked or something, right? And really the goal here is to optimize some sort of long-term health goals of the user. Um, that could be weight loss, uh, that could be uh, maintaining your sugar levels if you're a diabetic, um, helping you sleep better at night and so on. Right, so uh, this is what I've described to you so far is a pretty typical um, process underlying a generic reinforcement learning problem. So let's, let's, let's annotate it with some of the terminology that comes up in the area that's going to be useful for us throughout this talk. So the first thing we observe, this user state, is usually uh, called a context or a state in the reinforcement learning parlance. And we, we observe this 
object, then we make a decision or choose an action. We'll use these two words interchangeably. And upon making this choice, the world reveals some sort of reward to us, indicating whether this choice was sort of good and bad. But really, this uh, the, the reward we observe here, like the calories burned, is just sort of an imperfect Im indicator, imperfect proxy on how uh, how well our choices are doing towards meeting the longer-term health goals, right? So we don't just um, care about uh, the calories burned at one given um, exercise uh, routine. We we care about how well we are doing towards these longer-term uh, health goals, which uh, which we get an imperfect window of, uh, through these rewards of. Right. So now we can now now that we've uh, realized these uh, more general concepts, we could take the example and really put it in a more abstract setting, where we have an interaction between a world and an agent. The agent starts by sensing the current context of the world. Now, based on this context, it would like to choose an action, right? Like the activity recommendation, and this mapping which goes from a context to an action is called a policy. It's, a, it's the agent's behavior policy. So the agent has an underlying policy which it uses to decide uh, what to do, observes a reward, and this process repeats over and over again. Right, so the, the, every, uh, if, if in the uh, activated recommendation example, the, the, the user is hopefully using this app uh, over an extended period of time, and there are many, many users of the app, so, so that, that, that's why these, the, the, this uh, interaction process repeats. And the goal is to find a policy that maximizes kind of the sum of rewards over time, right? So, so that, that, that's, that's how we think about long-term goals. It's not just the reward we obtain at one particular round, but we want to uh, optimize the overall sum of rewards we get over some extended period of time. And if we can enable this uh, this generic loop, it turns out it can have a broad range of many disruptive applications. So we've already mentioned uh, personalized recommendations, which we are already uh, seeing deployed. People are excited about a variety of applications in uh, education and health domains, um, in optimizing all kinds of uh, uh, things related to resource allocation, um, configuration of uh, network parameters and so on. So all kinds of interesting problems in computer systems, in uh, large-scale autonomous systems like uh, drones, ACs, and so on. Um, the gaming industry really seems uh, ready for a big disruption with, again, using these uh, reinforcement learning agents to develop uh, better game AI, better developer tools, and so on. Now, one thing you might be wondering as I'm talking to you is, um, well, machine learning is having already such a big impact in, in the industry. Why do I need this uh, uh, reinforcement learning thing, right? And um, I, I would like to take a minute to contrast uh, what we typically think about uh, machine learning, which is supervised learning, uh, with what we think about in reinforcement learning, right? And, and I would like to call out the distinction between two, two uh, related but very different quantities. One is a prediction and one is a decision, right? So supervised learning, like uh, like uh, doing object recognition, like doing OCR, like doing speech recognition, these are all um, uh, prediction problems, right? We, 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 we see something and we try to predict what it contains and in our data sets, we get some sort of ground truth about whether we made the correct prediction or not. And sometimes doing that prediction is really uh, the task you care about but oftentimes a prediction is just uh, something along the path to helping you make better decisions in uh, some application. Right, so let's think through what the distinction looks like. For instance, if we are in recommendation settings, we might try to predict something like whether a user is going to click or not uh, on, on, uh, on a displayed recommendation, but that's not what we actually care about. We just care about making good recommendations to users, right? So we might only try, we might try to predict this quantity, but that's just on the path to making good recommendations. In a conversational system, you might try to predict the user's intent from the conversation snippet you've seen so far, but really what you would like to do is you would like to predict the next utterance the agent should uh, take in order to 
uh, result in an overall useful conversation. And similarly, if you're optimizing the, the, the um, l l let's say, um, um, if you're trying to uh, do cash optimization, you might be trying to predict something about uh, how the queue size is going to behave if you allocate things a certain way, but that's not what you actually care about. What you actually care about is uh, how you route. Right, so in all of these things, the prediction is not the actual thing uh, that, that the problem wants you to do well on. You, you want to be able to make good decisions. And what's useful is if you start thinking about the, the decisions directly rather than the predictions that you're making along the path, there are several uh, benefits you start to witness. So one is uh, when we think about um, the error in our predictions, well, we might have certain errors that have actually no real impact on the reward the agent gets because we might be making sort of uh, prediction errors in cases where it does not matter or between choices which have equally good reward uh, when, when, when we take those actions in the real world, right? So if we directly reason about our decisions and the rewards we get by making those decisions, we can uh, do much, much more, uh, uh, much more informed trade-offs. Um, one of the things that we're going to talk about in just a moment is thinking about the types of decisions we are making makes us worry about the quality of data we have, um, and uh, in particular gives rise to this exploration issue. Uh, that we're going to uh, actually hear uh, a fair bit more about today. And really, this type of reasoning, I would say, is, is, is a key ingredient in designing adaptive learning agents that uh, sort of learn as they interact with the world and improve over time, which is something that we would all like to see, I hope, for a variety of reasons. Now, doing this does not come easy. So definitely, when we go from uh, go to reinforcement learning, there are some additional challenges. Uh, that we have to solve, which are not necessarily present in uh, standard uh, supervised learning, right? So the, the first one, which is common between reinforcement learning and supervised learning, is that we would like to have good generalization, right? So it's not like we have, uh, uh, we have, um, so, so, so in, the, in this example, if you think about just one specific user, then when each time they come to the app, they probably have slightly different combinations of, you know, the calories they've consumed so far, the, 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 their, their heart rate, and uh, how, how, good they, how well did they sleep last night, and so on, right? So even it, it, it's not like the, the, the context of a user that the system senses is identical over time. Almost all interactions have different contexts, and we cannot hope to reason across them separately. We, we need to generalize across the various contexts the same way you don't say, you, you don't uh, try to do OCR by like um, reasoning about each particular squiggle somebody might put on the paper separately. You try to generalize across them. However, there are some additional challenges you get, right? So rem note here that when we recommend an activity, we only get to observe the reward outcome for the activity we recommended. We don't know what would have happened if we recommended something else. So there, there is no notion of like a ground truth label that we are getting. And this is, this is the part where we only, so we only get to observe the quality of the action we choose. And this is what necessitates what's called exploration. We have to try uh, different choices and only that, that's only how we learn about them. And finally, there is this uh, part about you observe something in the short term, but that's only a proxy for what you care about in the long term. And this is called the problem of trade assignment because uh, what's going to happen, right? So uh, you're going to probably recommend activities to a, to a user many, many times before you make any real dent in their long-term health goals. And if you do or you don't have a good impact on the long-term health goals, it's not very easy to tell which of the various activity recommendations you made to them was responsible in, in moving uh, the needle on the overall goal. Right, and this is, a, this is a very nasty problem uh, to handle in general and gives rise to a lot of hardness of reinforcement learning. Nevertheless, I hope 
uh, we, we, we are, we are uh, together in believing that if we could address these types of challenges, we could enable some cool things. So let's think about why uh, reinforcement learning is hard for just a, mo uh, just a bit longer before I tell you uh, what can we do about it. So like I said, there are three challenges. We have generalization, we have exploration, and we have this uh, credit assignment problem. And it turns out if you would like an agent that can solve all three of them together, right, so is, that can sort of um, really solve the intersection of these problems, it's, it's impossible. It's, it's, it's not like you, you need somebody really clever who will come up with a technique to do it. It, it, it it's something that's sort of provably impossible for anybody uh, to do using a reasonable amount of data, using a reasonable amount of interactions with the real world. And the intuition for that is actually very simple. So, so let's imagine a gigantic search tree, okay? So, so we, can, we can build a really deep tree with lots of, uh, lots of leaf, leaves. And imagine I told you that there is, a, there is a golden path in this tree. So if you take the, the golden path, you get a reward of one. Every other path, if you traverse it, you get a reward of zero for uh, reaching the corresponding leaf node. Now, of course, there's, lots, lots, lot, there's gonna be lots and lots of leaves in this tree if we, if we make it deep, right? The number of leaves is exponentially large in the depth. And if all the nodes are just different from each other, then basically the only way you find the, the golden path is by trying all paths in the worst case, right? So you will need to sort of traverse these exponentially many paths. There is nothing that allows you to collapse them. That, there is nothing that allows you to generalize across them. And this is, this is a problem that a hypothetical reinforcement learning agent which solves the intersection of these three challenges would be able to solve. And because this is, a, this is a problem we can't hope to solve, the, gen, the generic problem of reinforcement learning is going to be hard. Okay, so it was my job to disappoint you. Now John is going to actually tell you that we can, we can do something, and then I'll come back uh, in a bit. Hello. All right, so uh, it turns out that there are various special cases of reinforcement learning. And those special cases of reinforcement learning are the places where we can really hope to create tools that are of great use. So we're each going to cover some special cases of reinforcement learning next. I'm going to start with contextual bandit learning. This is kind of a bread and butter thing. We started working on contextual bandit learning in 2007. Uh, and uh, at this point, we have you know, deployed systems. Uh, they're going to GA at uh, Ignite in a week, so that seems really great. So in contextual bandit learning, uh, you, you have the same kind of setup as you do for reinforcement learning. You have some sort of uh, observed user state, so that's the context for contextual bandit learning. You have uh, an activity recommendation, that's the action, and then you have the calories burned, that's the reward, right? So that it's a, as before, your goal is typically to optimize some sort of long-term thing, but we're going to um, we're going to make a a big assumption here. We're going to assume that there's no dependence between events, right? So uh, the recommendation that I give you today doesn't affect the outcome to the recommendation that I give you tomorrow, right? Or the recommendation that I give to Alec doesn't affect uh, the way that I'll behave or you're, you'll behave under some other recommendation. So that's, that's a big assumption. It's obviously not true in many cases. And yet when it's true or when it's close to true, suddenly reinforcement learning becomes dramatically more tractable. So uh, when we're thinking about reinforcement learning, we're thinking, typically thinking about policies. And this, what the, I want to reemphasize something that Alex said, which is that a, a policy is, uh, is a, it's a, it's a mapping of features to actions. It could be a neural network. It could be a decision tree. The representation doesn't really matter. When we're thinking about policies, we're thinking about something which acts in the world. It actually affects the reward which is observed. And it's, it's critical that it actually affect the reward which is observed, or else the learning algorithms for these things just don't even work. Right? All right, so uh, if we're trying to solve contextual bandit learning, there's kind of two very key fundamental questions. One of them is, 
how do you collect the right data? Because if you don't collect the data for different possibilities, you're not going to be able to solve the problem effectively. The other one is, how do you evaluate the quality of a policy? How do you know when you have succeeded? So these are the, the two kind of key questions you need to answer in order to, uh, to really make progress. So for collecting the right data, you're going to have a policy. That policy is going to take actions in the world. And conceptually, you want this policy to do two different things. You want it to uh, exploit uh, using all the information that it has so far to get the best performance that it can achieve. You also want to explore so it tries other possibilities and discovers the information necessary in order to exploit better in the future. So a large number of papers are about this explore exploit trade-off. Right? So you're exploiting for performance, you're exploring to discover new things, and now the question is exactly how do you best explore so as to uh, so as to maximize your, your total performance over time. And the nature of the best exploration algorithms is not a simple epsilon greedy, sometimes I explore, sometimes I exploit type thing. The nature of the best algorithms is more like, I'm going to explore over all the plausibly best alternatives. So that there's several different things which could be the, the best. I don't know which one it is right now, given the information that I have so far. I'm going to explore over those. And over time, the set of possibilities kind of narrows down until you're acting uh, it's deterministically. Okay, so this explore exploit trade-off is, is is very fundamental. It's something that uh, you need to understand in order to think about reinforcement learning. And in contextual bandits, it's, it's, it's in its most elemental form. Now, if you have exploration information, this enables a superpower of sorts. So you can do counterfactual evaluation. But when you're doing counterfactual evaluation, um, you can evaluate policies that you've never actually deployed in the real world. That seems like a lot of fun. It's like saying, I don't have to do A-B tests anymore. It's not entirely true. There are many other uses for A-B tests. But if you're do, trying to do an A-B test for the purpose of optimizing a policy, you're probably much better off using counterfactual evaluation to optimize it offline and then deploying the optimized policy. So I'll give you a sense of what this means. So let's think about content recommendation. So we're going to try to recommend a, a, a news story to somebody and see if they're interested to in that. So you have a user that comes to a website. They have some features. They're a teacher from Texas. Uh, there's a policy, which is going to make a decision. Uh, maybe they display a space article, and then the user reads it. That's great. Uh, another user comes. They have some features. The uh, engineer from Seattle, uh, a policy chooses a, a food article, and they read it. And, and this continues. So you have an engineer from Seattle who ignores a space article, another engineer from Texas who uh, reads the space article, and so forth a million times. Okay, so given this information, later on, you'd kind of like to evaluate a policy which says, uh, if it's an engineer, we'll provide a space article, and if it's a teacher, we'll provide a food article. You can look into your data set, and you can go, ah, yes, I have a bunch of events which agree with this. Right? And then you can, you can look at those events, and you can see what fraction of the time the, uh, the, the, the article was read. And that gives you a value for the policy. And you can do the same thing with the location rule. So suppose we wanted to display space articles to people from Texas and food articles to people from Seattle. There's some fraction of the time that the events which agree with that rule uh, were uh, occur in the data. Uh, and then for those events, there's some fraction of the time that you actually have a, a read event. Right? So you have, you have a reward. Okay, so this is, uh, it seems great. This is very much like an A-B test in some sense, except you're doing it after the fact. But there's a trick here. The trick is kind of amazing. If you look closely, you see that there's a single event which is being used for both. And that would never occur in an A-B test. Because in an A-B test, you split your events across the two different uh, rules, two different policies. 
So this doesn't really matter when you're at uh, the scale of trying out two rules. But if you wanted to test a million rules or a billion rules, this is this is a huge thing. Uh, suddenly you can you can do that. So if you have uh, you do have to worry about things like the variance of your estimators. It turns out that the relationship is exponential. So with the data for 21 A/B tests, you can evaluate a billion different rules. And this is what enables uh, uh, contextual bandit learning at a fundamental level. Okay, so this is this is the intuition for why counterfactual evaluation works. Every event is in some sense exploring every policy which chooses the action that agrees that was taken in that event. Now, in terms of the math, uh, you have some features, an action, a probability of choosing that action, and then some sort of observed reward. Your goal is to evaluate this policy. So uh, one way to do this is to take an empirical expectation of the reward times an indicator function, which is 1 when the policy agrees with the chosen action, and 0 otherwise, and then divide that by the probability. This is mostly intuitive to people because the a reward, big reward is good. It means the, the value of your estimator is bigger. And you kind of expect to check for the actions where you agree, where your policy agrees with what's observed. The division by the probability is kind of the fun part. And the interesting thing about that is that you can prove that it's unbiased. So the claim is for any policy, and for any distribution over the features and a hidden reward vector, the expectation of your estimator is the expected reward of the policy's chosen action. So that division by P is critical in making this unbiased. And because it's unbiased and because you have those very strong for alls, uh, you can use this over and over again. So we use this routinely. This new personal, uh, personalizer service has this built in. Uh, kind of actual evaluation, I think, is a dramatic improvement in the experience of a data scientist trying to solve these problems. Because instead of waiting weeks for an A-B test to get some idea of how good their policy is, they can check in a minute on uh, some held out data. All right, so I'm only scratching the surface here. Tutorial that Alec and I did at ICML, which has many more details. There's a new personalizer service. There's many Contextual bandit algorithms will implement in Vopal Wabbit. These are all things that you can look at further if you want more details. All right, so, um, so next up, I'm going to talk to you about a different um, way of simplifying the complexity of reinforcement learning. And uh, that's not making, by making an assumption on the structure of the problem but by making an assumption about the type of data that we have access to, and this is the paradigm called imitation learning. So let's go back to our running example. We have the same three, three steps we saw before, but now we assume access to some sort of an expert. Okay, so, so imagine that um, you, know, you, you have this app, um, and what you have is you have a fitness expert consulting with you who, um, checks at least for maybe some fraction of the users, oh, uh, tells you, oh, here's what I would have done if I were recommending an activity to the user based on their long-term goals, right? And you, you, you record uh, this recommendation. And, and the rest of the picture is the same. Now, uh, let's think about what such an expert uh, might provide us. Oh, uh, sorry, before I do that, I, the other thing I do want to point out, uh, while I call an expert here, uh, as we will go through this narrative, we, we, uh, we will sometimes relax an expert to just be some existing uh, maybe production system that you have access to, which is not necessarily giving you expert, but um, okay, not great type of uh, um, ideas about what to do. Okay, so, so why do we care about replicating an expert? Uh, well, the, one idea would be, well, if I have access to an expert, do I need to actually, do I need to do something algorithmic even, right? Do I, do I, need, do I need a policy? Do I need a model? Maybe I can just use the expert. That's true, you could, but the expert doesn't scale. You could use maybe the expert across 
five users, ten users, but you cannot really um, have the user, uh, the expert, choosing recommendations by hand for millions or billions of users. Even if this somehow magically could, it's not really feasible to imagine that an expert can easily personalize. Even if they know what's good for you, they might not. Even, even if they knew exactly what's good for you, given your goals, it's very hard for people to figure out which recommendations you, you would actually uh, accept. Right? So if the recommendation was go run a triathlon, you might not do it. Right? So, so, so it's, we, we have to think not, uh, not just about uh, what's good for you, but what you're actually likely to uh, to to uh, to take as a recommendation and it's very hard to personalize these things by hand for a human and that creates a, often a pretty easy avenue to improve upon uh, an expert right but but that's kind of the, the the second reason why we care about trying to distill the expert down to a model because if we could do so then maybe we could also learn how to do better than the expert on the other hand clearly Right, so the expert has given us something very powerful. When we were talking about uh, the, the reinforcement learning problem in the beginning, I said, well, you, you, choose, you make a choice, you find out about the reward of that chosen action, and you don't know what would have happened if you did something else. Well, if you truly believe in this expert, they just told you what the ground truth is. They just told you this was the right thing to do in this setting. So you're suddenly in supervised learning land again. You could just train a classifier that tries to predict the expert's action based on the context you observed, and you, you're, you, you make a good prediction. If you match the expert, you made a bad prediction if you don't. Right? So, so we've kind of gone back to the familiar supervised learning land. And basically, depending on the assumptions you make on the expert, assuming access to such data can basically simplify the need for exploration or create assignment or both. Right? So that's why having access to such an expert can be quite powerful. Okay, so how do we leverage these experts? The first idea is basically what I've already described to you, right? So um, you 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 get some sort of an expert to consult with you. Um, you basically have them uh, generate some trajectories, trying to accomplish a task. Like you know, maybe maybe the expert can uh, fly around a drone for you in some particular man maneuver that you care to learn. Right, and you you just record uh, the, the 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 context that the expert is generating, the actions that they're choosing in response to those contexts, the next context that's getting generated, and so on and so forth. Right, you you observe that whole interaction process, you record it, you record it many many times, build some sort of a data set. This is like we discussed. This is this looks very much like a multi-class classification data set. Right, we have some context, we have possible actions we could have taken, we know the right one, we can just shove this data set into our favorite supervised learning algorithm, it builds a classifier, and we could reinterpret this classifier as a policy for a reinforcement learning agent. Seems simple, seems something that should be ready to go in many cases. Okay, uh, so we have to be a bit cautious. Um, so this is an experiment that um, Stefan Ross, uh, uh, who was who was a grad student at uh, Carnegie Mellon at the time, uh, did. So here's the game of Mario. Um, uh, on the left, you see an expert playing. They're doing pretty well. They're going to get a pretty high score in the game. Now, you, you do this exact classification uh, idea in order to try and imitate the expert. And um, strange things start to happen. The agent gets stuck. The agent uh, falls and uh, dies, and um, all kinds of uh, failures start to happen that the expert was not experiencing. Well, why does this happen? Well, remember, when we train our classifiers in supervised learning, we don't get 100% accuracy. We definitely don't get 100% accuracy on text, test data, even if we get... Uh, this thing wouldn't... Pause. That's kind of disturbing. Okay, I'm going to go to the next slide and... Okay. Um, <laughs> right. So, so we know we make errors in classification algorithms. Right now, the moment you make a mistake, the next state 
might be very diff might be something you've never seen in your data before like you didn't eat the mushroom to get big well that's a problem because you were always getting big in in the expert trajectories beyond that point and now you don't know how to act right so so small errors at one time step can put you in states that you never saw in the expert trajectories at the at future time steps and now you 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 have a distribution uh, shift problem which is uh, usually called the problem of compounding errors these small errors can kind of build up into a uh, into a big future uh, mismatch so so that that's a, that that makes these algorithms kind of brittle and this is a well known problem that people have um, since figured out very intuitive and nice ways to solve so here i'll just illustrate one of the simplest ones which is to really use the oracle in the loop rather than just having this one off access via data set to them right so we have we have this we have now we we actually start from the agent which has some initial policy the agent executes the 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 policy in the environment to collect some trajectory gives this trajectory to the expert the expert tells you well okay actually if i were finding myself in these states that you you generated here are the actions denoted by stars that i would have chosen instead of instead of the ones you choose so again this the agent the agent can interpret this as a data set put it into a supervised learner get some sort of a, a policy execute the new policy get a new data set from the expert now you have uh, the the first data set and the second data set you can take them together build a build an even better policy and you can do this many many times right so what's happening is as the agent starts to make some mistakes in imitating the expert and goes into new states it has the chance to show those states to the expert and get them labeled and in this way as the process starts to converge you you kind of uh, uh, learn to imitate the expert much better and this very simple idea uh, introduced in an algorithm called dagger has since uh, uh, been um, studied and refined and advanced in uh, many different ways uh, there's a very nice tutorial that um, john and hal did at icml 2015 which uh, covers at least a, a good chunk of the uh, state of the art um, circa 2015 in the area and it it the research in stop in 2015 people have been doing um, a lot of uh, work it's still pretty active in particular one of the things uh, we 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 keep seeing a lot of interesting results around is uh, uh, as i remarked the expert doesn't actually have to be an expert they just have to sort of um often um help you get to a good enough point and then you can from that good enough point learn to improve upon yourself how best to do this it's it, it, it's something that's still being actively researched i i've mostly just told told you about you know we can we can we can try to build policies uh from the experts interaction but of course watching the expert act also tells you a lot about the the rules of the world right the way the world the world works the the the, the underlying laws of physics and um how um states and uh, how actions influence future states and so on and you can you can try to build uh models of the world to help you do better in these tasks as well one of the things that can be sometimes onerous in imitation learning is right the expert has to and so recording a video of an expert executing a task is pretty easy but if the expert has to then sit down and annotate oh this was the action i took at first step this was the action i took at second step and so on that can be uh pre onerous or you have to uh jurig some uh, special type of uh, sensing equipment to capture in an automated manner their actions right so one of the things people try to worry about is could we just learn from the video of the expert executing the task where we get to observe the states that they are inducing but not the action labels and another thing that we can do in order to again reduce the burden on the expert is if we could um, basically if the expert could somehow communicate ideas to us at a more abstract level rather than uh, very very sort of low level uh, muscle movement type of annotation that is often assumed here then we could again uh, reduce the amount of communication that has to happen between the agent and expert by a lot and this is often studied in the area of hierarchical imitation learning 
but in general having access to such an expert when you can is very powerful because it really tries to it really gets you much closer to supervised learning land uh, from reinforcement learning but still enables the same kinds of um, uh, things that a reinforcement learning agent uh, can do. And now John will come back and tell you how to do some real reinforcement learning really. All right, so I want to go back to uh, this hard problem. So th you have these three different things in reinforcement learning that, that come together to create a really hard problem. You have generalization, uh, credit assignment, and, and exploration. So if you think about any pair of these, we actually know how to solve them fairly well. If you think about just generalization and uh, credit assignment, it's actually something that uh, many of the policy improvement style algorithms or many of the imitation learning style algorithms can get at pretty effectively. Uh, if you think about exploration and generalization, well, that's what contextual bands are doing. Right? There's no credit assignment problem there. And so the problem becomes easy. We know how to solve that pretty effectively. It's also the case that if you look at exploration and credit assignment, so no generalization problem, it's, it's easy. Uh, so that's, that's something which is we haven't discussed in detail. Uh, the first uh, paper of that sort was probably the E-cubed algorithm, which was in 1999, I think, so it was 20 years ago. And so uh, we've known how to solve the credit assignment problem with exploration efficiently uh, for quite a long time. It's just that it doesn't include generalization, and so it ends up not being very useful in practice. Right, so um, that suggests there's a possibility and we're going to get into some very current research in the sense that it's not even quite out yet. I expect it to come out next week. If you have a small number of underlying states generating complex observations, is it possible to do reinforcement learning? Because when you, when you, when you, you look at these MDP learning algorithms, they're, they're, they're working with a relatively small number of states. Uh, maybe if the world is such that there's a small number of underlying states, we can actually do the learning, even if we needed to do generalization as well. So that's uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> all right, so let's think about a particularly hard problem. So I'm going to have uh, two initial start states, which are randomly chosen. And then I'm going to have an action, which leads to two next states, but the one that it leads to is, it's again, random. So I'm trying to create a really hard problem here, just to, to illustrate that what we're trying to solve. Uh, and then this other, uh, this lower state, will have a different action, which 50% 50, 50 chance goes to each of these two different next states. So uncertain outcomes given an action. And then I'm going to have a whole bunch of distracting actions, which lead to this third state. I'm going to call that the bad state, even though you actually get a, a little bit of reward when you go to this bad state. Right? Okay, so you have nine actions which lead to the bad state, one action which leads 50-50 to these two upper states. And now I'm going to repeat this 100 times. Okay. And, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, say, ah, there's a big reward in these two good states at the end. Okay, so now this might seem like a hard problem to solve. I actually claim this is easy to solve. This was solved 20 years ago with the E cubed algorithm. They could solve this, this very easily. Now the thing which is a little tricky, the extra twist, is that I'm not going to tell you the states. Instead I'm going to have an observation which is generated by the states. All of these four observations come from the same state. It's a stochastic process. It, it, it's, it's fairly complex um, in terms of, of what is actually observed. You never observe the same thing twice, so you can never reason based upon, oh, I saw this before, and therefore I should do this next. So that, that completely breaks the E-cubed algorithm. 
in all of its uh, derivative sense. And, and now the question is, how can we actually succeed? So just, just to go through things explicitly, um, we have stochastic start state that breaks a lot of algorithms. We have stochastic transitions that breaks a lot of other algorithms. We have these unfavorable dynamics. So if you act randomly, you tend to lose. That breaks a bunch of algorithms. We have these anti-shaped rewards, these rewards that, which lead you in the wrong direction. That breaks many more algorithms. We have, okay, this is a fun one, uh, Google sparsity. So this is 10 to the 100 is the word, is, is Google, one, one Google. So we have a one in one Google chance of actually observing a large reward if we act randomly, right? If we just act a uniform randomly all the way through. So the number of atoms in the universe is like 10 to the 80. So this substantially exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. Okay, and then the last thing is, is that generalization is really required. You have to somehow generalize across your observations in order to decide what to do effectively. So that's all the challenges that we're going to want to solve if we're going to be able to cope with an arbitrary underlying small state space. Okay, so uh, we can try this out on various um, common reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, one of these is uh, advantage actor critic. And okay, so we have about 100 different states going across. And you can see that it's only initially that there's any visitation of the upper good states. So um, not too surprising if you understand how these algorithms work. Then we can take a look at proximal policy optimization, which is another one of these uh, common algorithms people try to apply. And again, it, it just visits a few of these upper good states, and then it, it, it is all bad all the way through. Okay, so then uh, we can search around for other uh, benchmarks. We actually found one which is non-trivial. Um, uh, there's this random network distillation approach, uh, which came out last year. And there we can actually get it to... Um, visit these good states for a good ways, and then it, it kind of peters out over time, and again, you can't get to the solution. All right, so there's a new algorithm, which should be an archive next week, which looks like this. It, it visits all these states. That's, that seems like a lot of fun. Um, if you look at the performance of the algorithm in terms of how large a problem it can solve, it can just power through to the, the 100 time horizon situation very effectively. Essentially, all the other algorithms we've tried kind of break after about horizon six, uh, except for random network distillation, which can go up to 25. So, so R&D is pretty fun, but, uh, but Homer is really nailing it hard. Um, so I want to give you a sense of how this works, because I think that gives you a sense of how you can hope to succeed in solving this, this very hard problem directly. So Homer is an uh, is a, is a inductive algorithm. So we're always going to be operating in the Horizon 100 situation, but we're only going to be trying to reach the Horizon 2 states initially, and then the Horizon 3 and 4 and so forth up to... Uh, 100. And what we're going to do is uh, we're going to assume something inductively. We're going to assume that we have a policy cover, which means these, this is a set of policies which can reach all the states for the previous time step. So we're going to have to create that for the next time step as we go through this iterative process. And so we're going to sample one of these policies uniformly from this policy cover. And then we're going to uh, for h minus 1 steps, roll in with this policy, and then we'll act uniform random for the next step. So we, this is after h minus 1 steps, we see x, and then we take an action that's uniform random, and then we see a next observation, x prime. And then what we're going to do is corrupt the data. We're going to, 50% chance, keep what we observe, 
and with 50% chance, swap X prime with some other X prime that we observed. Okay, so this seems a little bit funny, but this is, this is, this is how we're going to cre create a, uh, an artificial problem that we're then going to solve. The artificial problem is predict whether X prime is corrupted. We're do going to do this in a little bit of a funny way. So typically you would say, oh, I'm going to just find some function which can predict the label, uh, which is either 0 or 1, given X, A, and X prime. Instead, we're going to we're going to have the, give a little bit of structure to that. So there's going to be some p, which uses a phi of x prime and a phi prime on x prime. Right. Um. <clears throat> okay, so let's assume we can solve this problem. This is a, a standard supervised learning problem. It's not too crazy to try to solve it. Uh, assuming we solve it, we can look at all of the values that phi prime takes. So in particular, we might want to restrict the range of phi prime. We might want to say phi prime can only have, you know, 12 discrete values. Uh, we're going to define a reward, which is one whenever we achieve that value. All right. So then, uh, after we've defined this reward, we're going to call this. Uh, PSTP function, which I'm not going to define for you, but basically what this is doing is it's saying, look, I'm going to use contextual bandits over and over again to find a policy which can achieve this value, and I can, I can guarantee that relatively easily. Uh, so this is this creates a policy which homes to that value of phi prime. <clears throat> okay, and then. Uh, and then once we've done this for each of the different values of phi prime, we can create a policy cover by just grouping together the policies that we've discovered. And now after we're done, we can create a policy cover for all the different time steps and that, just return that. Okay, so, so I haven't solved for a particular external reward function, but once you can know how to reach all the corners of the d dynamic space, it becomes easy to just find the optimal policy using the same technique that we're talking about here. All right, so um, this is this is an interesting algorithm. It's kind of illustrating how we can build up a, uh, a, a representation for an underlying state space through these ancillary prediction problems. And now we'd like to actually know this is going to work. So obviously we created a really hard problem, but maybe we missed something. Maybe there's some other way that, um, that, that you know, a problem can be hard. But we can actually make a claim here. Um, I'm going to define a block markup decision process, which essentially says that for every x, there's a unique s which generates it, which means that it's possible given x to predict which the underlying, what the underlying state is. So given the observation, you can predict what the underlying state is. And then I'm going to think about Oracle learning. I'm going to assume that essentially all the learning problems that I'm creating, the, the regression problem that I created in, 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 inside the PSDP box, the contextual bandit problems that I created, those are, are solved perfectly. So let's, just, let's not worry about errors in those right now. Uh, so if you can solve these perfectly, then it turns out you can prove that you can solve all block MDP problems in uh, a polynomial time in the number of states, actions, and time horizon. So it's not a coincidence that we had that really nice visitation of all states. That's what will happen for any block MDB problem that you happen to create. Right? And, and the key thing here, the thing which is very different from a lot of other RL algorithms, is that this is independent of the size of the observation space. And so in particular, you could do things like concatenate together all the observations from all the previous time steps and say that's my observation for the next time step. And that's okay as far as the number of samples we need in order to learn effectively. Okay, so this is, this is a new style of algorithm. This is a, 
a very active research area. These are just some of the other people who are involved in the process. There's a bunch of uh, fun questions we're trying to figure out. How do we make this to be a more incremental algorithm? How do we uh, handle continuous states and actions? How do we handle combinatorial states? If we can, if we can figure out how to master these questions, then I think that this is, this is a new kind of tractable reinforcement learning, which we can hope to use over and over again in, in practice. All right, so this gives, um, this is at the very forefront of what we're working on in terms of reinforcement learning. I want to kind of give you a summary. So the first thing I would say is that reinforcement learning is useful in practice now. We have this personalizer service out, which is uh, getting used heavily. Uh, RL is intractable in general, and it's important to understand that because right now a lot of tender love and care goes into a number of the advanced applications of reinforcement learning. Uh, figuring out exactly how to, f to create a, a tractable island is, I think, where we're trying to go with research, right? So what are the natural forms of reinforcement learning which are tractable? We went through some, so no dependence between events, that's contextual bandits, that's good. If you have imitation sources available, we have several ways to use these, and that, that, that's good, it's very helpful. Uh, if you have these small identifiable underlying state spaces, that's, that's great, it's, it seems like they can put us into a, a new regime for solving problems, and maybe there are others. If we can figure out what these other islands of tractability are, that is, I think, really the future of reinforcement learning in real-world applications. Yeah? So is the biggest challenge is actually the assumption that no, independent, no dependence between events? Because in fact, I think they usually are. Yeah, I think there's almost always some dependence between events. And the question is, can you neglect that or not? Right. Right? Do we in many cases, you can. Like uh, the news article that maybe interests you um, just is not related to the one that interests you, right? So, so that their independence is, is a reasonable type of thing. Other times, it's not so reasonable. And um, exactly how we solve this is tricky, right? So that, that, that's, that's this one. If you have an expert who can help you, it's also very powerful, yes. right? And if it, if it happens to be the case that there's some sort of small underlying dynamics, then that also ends up being tractable, right? And then maybe there are other things as well. If we can figure these out, that's, that's kind of where the excitement is, where the magic is. Yeah? So what's the, what's the limitation of small? Yeah, so uh, we're polynomial. Obviously, we can handle like 100. Um, I would say that at 10,000, I would start really worrying about the how complex that is. I think there's a lot of room to improve on the algorithm that I showed you. I mean, one way to think about the limitation is in units of, let's say, supervised learning sample complexity, right? So if you needed a certain amount of data to solve uh, typical uh, classification problems in a particular domain, and now you take the same domain and you imagine a reinforcement learning problem with a small underlying state space there, it'll scale uh, at least linearly with the size of that state space. So that, that's how your sample, uh, the sample requirement will go up. And now how much data you can collect will determine like how many states uh, you can handle. Other questions? Yeah. The state space of Go is large. Yeah, probably. Um, so it doesn't, does it fit under any of those tractable? Yeah, so um, not quite. So the first version of Go used imitation learning uh, quite a bit. And I actually thought that was required, but they managed to get away from that, which is very impressive, actually. So they, I think what's going on with, with that version is it is the case that if you have a board and then you have a slightly different board, maybe the optimal move doesn't change too much in a number of cases. So I suspect there's something like an almost continuous structure 
not quite continuous. It's not quite the right concept, but there's, there's like a similarity structure between nearby um, boards, which is extremely helpful. The other thing which goes on with Go is um, it, it just turns out to be the case that minimax plays value is often very close to random random plays value. And so they're using that very heavily in the process of trying to solve Go. And so it's like they have a, a pretty decent expert available uh, for uh, evaluating uh, a board position's value. Any other questions? All right, we'll take a break for about 15 minutes. At 10.15, uh, Sarv is going to tell us about how to solve NLP problems. There's these new tools which are coming out, and uh, essentially they're required if you want state-of-the-art performance. Hi, this is John Langford. Um, I'm, I, I want to primarily uh, discuss assumptions around uh, reinforcement learning, but uh, I am watching for uh, further questions, so if you have further questions, please uh, send them along. Okay, so one thing which I think is really important in applying reinforcement learning is figuring out which which kind of reinforcement learning you can actually apply effectively. And this is a bit of an art form because it's almost always the case that, well, it is always the case that the, the forms of reinforcement learning are sort of defined by a set of assumptions. And those assumptions don't exactly match what your actual application is. So for example, it's, it's almost all, it, it is always the case that, uh, that the contextual bandit assumption the, the idea that the action you take doesn't influence what you observe next um, is wrong. Um, but nevertheless, it's a really good assumption to make in many situations because if it's, if it's close to the truth, then you can find a good solution very efficiently. And, and so it may not be the best possible solution in the sense that if you assumed you had a really complex reinforcement learning problem, then maybe, theoretically, if you saw a trillion examples, you'd get an even better solution. But because you never actually see a trillion examples, the independence assumption between events in contextual balance is very powerful. Another version of this is the, the Markov assumption, right? So if you're assuming that your world is going to behave according to Markov dynamics, where the state and the state alone determines what is going to happen next, <coughs> Then, uh, then you're making an assumption. That assumption is often true, uh, often untrue, or typically untrue. Uh, very commonly, there is something exogenous to what you're thinking of as your state, which does affect what happens next. And if you could effectively model and learn that, maybe you could do better if you had a trillion samples. But you don't have a trillion samples, and so you want to make these simplifying assumptions whenever you can. So I think the key thing when you have a reinforcement learning problem is you you want to have a lexicon of, of what are the simple kinds of reinforcement learning, what are the ways to solve things well, and then for each reinforcement learning problem you want to think about how you can map towards these, so which assumptions you can make, which means which, which concerns you're going to neglect, and that gives you a way to solve the problem effectively. Okay, so uh, there was one last question. In, uh, in the live feed, which is where we can follow things in more detail. So uh, archive is always a great place. Uh, we tend to post all of our papers on archive. I also pointed them to the reinforcement learning group web page where we yeah. usually have some amount of recent information. On yeah. the uh, another place where things appear now and then is on my blog, which is hunch.net. H-U-N-C-H dot N-E-T. Are there other questions we should try to answer? Yeah, so so I guess one thing I wanted to, uh, uh, a few people asked this regarding um, our activity recommendation example that we used as the running one, and uh, in particular, I think, uh, 
with regards to the contextual bandwidth setup there, uh, which is uh, whether we, uh, like how do we think about personalization in those settings, whether we are learning a separate model per user or we are uh, learning something more global. And, um, and basically the answer uh, really comes down to a few factors, right? So, so we know that uh, we are going to require some amount of um, data before we can start making meaningful decisions. And uh, do we want to wait and receive that amount of data from each individual user before we start doing something meaningful for them? Uh, in most settings, the answer is uh, not. Uh, we might not even see that much data from each uh, individual user. And you want to have a paradigm where actually your system kind of improves for everyone the more users you have for the application. So with that in mind, we have usually taken the approach of featureizing the users. And the features can include some unique uh, user-specific features like user IDs or something so that each user still has a slice as a model. Um, but we, we generally uh, do try to learn a joint model and uh, also optimize a joint performance across all users, uh, typically via an average. <clears throat> uh, There's another question that just came in. Do you think that a big problem with applying RL to real-world problems is that it is not as accessible to analysts working in commercial environments? It's simply not as simple to model problems as it would be to throw some data into a ML Python package. Do you think it is the responsibility of researchers to reach out and improve the accessibility by education and software, or will this naturally catch up if it can be shown to be effective to more problems? So I certainly believe there's a huge gap in the tools that are available for doing reinforcement learning compared to the tools that are available for doing supervised learning. Now, the, the nature of the tools for reinforcement learning, I think, inherently often needs to be different from the nature of the tools used for supervised learning. So in supervised <coughs> learning, you're sort of used to downloading the data on your computer and, and just uh, partying on it, right? But in reinforcement learning, it's actually pretty critical that you have a high fidelity, uh, how can I describe this? Uh, I've often found that attempts to do reinforcement learning fail because the logging is not high enough quality. And so reinforcement learning tends to be very dependent upon the quality of the logging. And that means that, uh, it's, it's very important that you have a high-quality logging system. Furthermore, if you're doing reinforcement learning against a live system, you never actually get all the data. You're just um, you're, you're interacting with the live system, and you're learning from those interactions as you go. So there's this maybe the, we should think about this as two different modes for reinforcement learning. Mode one is where you have a simulator instead of a data set, and you're trying to do reinforcement learning in that simulated environment. Mode two is where you're, you're doing reinforcement <coughs> learning with actual interactions with the real world. So mode one is a little closer to supervised learning, but you're working with simulators rather than data sets. Mode two, you're working with data sets, but it's more of a data source rather than data set. And that means that you, you, the, the nature of the tools that you need are, are different. Now, as far as who has responsibility, well, I think that um, I am happy to take responsibility for creating reinforcement learning tools. And we are actively working on this. Vopal Wabbit is an open source project. Uh, everybody is welcome to contribute to it. This is uh, the, the key algorithms behind the personalizer service, which I talked about in the, uh, in the presentation, in the webinar. This is um, a suite of tools and algorithms which you can use actively to get things done. So, um, I mean, the, the other thing I wanted to add was uh, there is definitely uh, a gap in the maturity of things available um, for supervised learning and reinforcement learning, but that also partly just reflects the maturity, the relative maturity of algorithms in the two fields. Like, uh, supervised learning definitely has become much closer to turnkey in that you can hope to uh, stick some data into an algorithm and get something somewhat sensible out of it in most cases. And um, as we were 
as you were discussing through a good bit of the presentation, reinforcement learning does require a lot more um, care and thought in exactly how you pose the problem and what what problem structures are uh, tractably solvable and so on. And um, and, and that part uh, makes it uh, a bit harder to uh, to 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 have general purpose tools out there because those tools will have their limitations and uh, part of it again can be uh, has to be addressed by education which is um, again something we are trying to do through uh, for instance webinars like this. There's another question. You've talked a bit about the independence between events assumption, but what about the scenario where the MDP assumption itself is not necessarily accurate? Are there any steps I can take to ensure that my algorithms still perform well in this case? That's a, actually pretty interesting. Uh, so there are algorithms which are a little bit more robust against breakdowns in the MDP assumption. So there's sort of policy improvement algorithms, which are essentially deciding based upon your observations what to do. And if those observations are not actually capable of summarizing everything, they'll still do the best they can. Uh, without given the, the the information that they have, so so that that family of algorithms I think does have a little bit more robustness against the breakdown of the MDP assumption. Yeah, so it really comes down to uh, you know what are the ways in which we are trying to leverage the Markov property of the environment. Like uh, if we were trying to build a full-on dynamics model of the world. Um, and we only we 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 assumed that a particular formulation of state is Markovian, and try to predict the next state using it. And if this turns out to be false, then we have a lot bigger problems than if we just uh, relied that we can, uh, you know, um, express good policies using a certain representation of state, or uh, express good value functions using a certain representation of state. Um, so, so you you have to choose the algorithms carefully there. Um, there's another question. In many commercial applications, there's a large lag in observing the reward, yep. e.g., waiting for an approval for a sale. Are there general tactics for mitigating problems caused by this reward? <coughs> so this is actually a, a very interesting topic because the pro the thing which makes reinforcement learning difficult is not actually a lag in the reward. Uh, you can have a reward which is delayed by a year, and as long as you knew exactly which action led to that reward, uh, it would be uh, still a relatively straightforward problem to solve in a context contextual bandit style formulation. So, uh, Well, there are two things. Uh, it should also be that when you actually incorporate that information a year later, it is still meaningful. So that that's true. That's true. <laughs> Yeah. World has not completely changed under that's, your feet. That's true, but but typically if there's a long delay, then yeah, I, it seems like the the world is not changing too fast. Um, the thing which makes reinforcement learning really hard is when you have several different actions that you take before you observe a reward. So if if you're in that situation, you're in a much more delicate, hard to solve problem. And uh, okay, so. The, the, there's three approaches that we discussed. One approach is with contextual bandits, you form a short-term proxy for your long-term reward, and then you just ignore the fact that it's not your long-term reward and solve a short-term proxy reward. Another approach is you have some reference algorithm which guides you through the, the sequence of possibilities, and you try to improve on that with respect to your long-term reward. And then the third approach is, is more like the, the, the last particularly advanced algorithm I discussed where you are uh, trying to, uh, you're assuming that there's some underlying state space that is latent, that is relatively small, and you're actively discovering the, the dynamics of the, of the world in order to <coughs> efficiently uh, learn a policy. Um, so, so I wanted to take uh, another one from the recent questions, which is, what are the things to keep in mind while formulating an environment all by ourselves for solving the problem? And this kind of, uh, uh, at least the way I view it, hinting to uh, the more general question that when we are setting up um, kind of an abstract problem, when we codify, codify it into uh, a reinforcement learning problem and define exactly what we mean by state and action, uh, uh, rewards, uh, what is the problem horizon and so on, there are several design choices involved here. And certainly, we have to be quite careful in that some of those will make the problem um, uh, 
significantly more or less tractable uh, to solve. Um, so in particular, uh, one thing people uh, worry about a lot in reinforcement learning is how to define the reward, uh, right? And uh, as you've seen, the rewards have kind of delicate semantics in that you, you, you have a reward that you can optionally observe at each time step, but then we have to make sure that overall in a trajectory, the rewards aggregate uh, to, our, to reflect our long-term goals to reinforce uh, desirable behaviors over time. And this can be quite tricky to do. Uh, if not done well, this can lead to all kinds of pathologies. There are weird examples like you have, uh, you're trying to design a vacuum cleaner, you give it a reward for picking up dust and it learns to uh, pick up dust, dump it, pick up dust and so on to, to get infinite reward, right? So we have to be very careful in defining the, uh, the right reward function. Uh, sometimes people again try to infer the reward function using um, uh, demonstrations and so on. This this field is called inverse reinforcement learning. Um, sometimes we can uh, simplify, obviously, the problem a lot down. If uh, we can get away with just formulating it as a contextual bandit problem, then uh, at least uh, we don't have to worry about uh, the long-term semantics of the rewards. But even there, the, the precise numerical encoding of the rewards can make a huge difference. And this is something we go into in more detail in the uh, tutorial that uh, that is uh, linked here under the additional resources. So if you're interested in um, uh, looking more into reward formulations, that that's maybe a good good place to look as well. Uh, and the other part is exactly how should we think about representing state. Um, and there maybe a good rule of thumb to think about is, uh, I mean, effectively in most problems uh, we are uh, you know casting the state. Uh, using some sorts of features, um, and uh, they can be the similar types of features that you would use in solving a supervised learning task in the same domain, right? So when people are using um, uh, reinforcement learning tasks where the observations are visual, they usually uh, would use a similar featureization of a similar encoding for the image that they would use in a uh, com uh, typical computer vision setting. Uh, maybe we aug augment it uh, to, uh, to 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 contain a bit about the the the, the past trajectory, but uh, but 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 the state you can think of uh, yeah similar features as you would have in a supervised learning task. Another question here: It appears human learning involves conceptualizing subtasks generally useful across contexts towards achieving a goal. Hierarchical RL seems to capture this to some extent. Nevertheless, actually, most things upstream seem hand engineered, <coughs> like providing a pool of goals as subtasks. Your thoughts on approaching this problem so that we can leverage the power of composition? So, uh, I think it's actually a fascinating research area. Uh, you're absolutely right that most people who are looking at this are kind of uh, hand crafting sub goals that, uh, that you work with. And that if you're in a situation where you're just trying to solve a reinforcement learning problem, it's actually a very sound strategy in many ways. Nevertheless, it is really appealing to try to create these sub goals automatically. And I don't, I don't have a good general purpose algorithm for this, but I would say that the Homer algorithm actually does have this structure to some extent. It's, uh, it's creating a, uh, subtasks of reaching each state on its frontier of explored sub uh, explored area, and then it's uh, it's using that subtask repeatedly to gather new information so as to advance the frontier of where it knows to how to explore effectively. Okay, one last question. Uh, I enjoyed this webinar. In a previous question, it was mentioned that there is no general guarantee on convergence to global optimal policy. Does there exist a guarantee of convergence stability boundedness to a local optimal policy? I mean, I guess uh, for policy improvement methods, you can... But you have a snake in the box, like examples. Yeah, so th the problem is that local convergence can still take exponential time. There's counterexamples which show that it, it, it can but, take an, an enormous amount of time. But that's only for 
uh, that's only for the one one step, right? So if I'm thinking if you literally did uh, policy gradient type algorithm, right? Policy like gradient for so, so think about uh, you're doing policy improvement mm -hmm. over a uh, hundred time steps, yeah, and you improve in one dimension, yeah. And then you can prove in another dimension, and now maybe you have to go back to the previous dimension to improve, and again and again and again and again for each of the different dimensions. So the number of times you might have to improve in a dimension in order to reach the global optima could be very. But large. we are not talking about global. So for for local. But it's uh, even to reach a local optima, right? Uh, it's, I mean, I it's it's very because it's uh, it's just a uh, at the end it's just a uh, smooth. Optimization problem, and it's uh, we are we are getting unbiased gradient estimates. So proving uh, at least like if everything in the environment is regular enough that uh, the objective is uh, smooth as a function of the policy parameters, then you will you will find a stationary. Okay, you will find a stationary point. The, 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 yes. Okay. Snake in the you box will, problem is uh, is a yeah yeah yeah. Right? Right. So in that case, yeah. the global optima is the local optima. And yeah, so you, that, you, the tricky thing is you will find a stationary point, but it can be a saddle point. Yeah. I think the, the answer is no, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so for general reinforcement learning, it is often very intractable. Uh, you can often improve on your current uh, solution. That's, that's relatively tractable. Um, you can test to see if there's a quick improvement on your, on your current solution with very, uh, relatively small deviations. If you're in, in contextual balance, then uh, it's relatively easy to get to the global optima. If you're in more general reinforcement learning, it gets tough. Um, so in, you want to read the question? Yeah, so, so we have a question saying, is it much harder to obtain our algorithms with good regret guarantees, uh, meaning that they have good performance along the learning path versus good final policy expected return guarantees, or are the two objectives more or less equivalent? Um, so I guess it depends a little bit on the precise setting. So in the in the tabular settings where bulk of the, the theoretical work has happened, there is actually, um, uh, there, is, there is a paper from Christoph, Dan, uh, and Emma Brunskill uh, and uh, Tor Latimore, which basically uh, provides like a unifying uh, way to get both pack and regret. Um, for um, in general, um, we have uh, I, th th there is not in most settings where we have. Uh, one or the uh, one a guarantee of one kind, we expect to get guarantee of the other kind as well. So I would say they are mostly comparable in difficulty. They want us to wrap up. So thank you all for uh, listening in. Uh